begin looking here in uh, Mark chapter 5. I'm going to begin reading at verse 21. I'll read to verse 24, and we'll get into our study. And we'll be looking at two wonderful healings. So beginning at verse 21, reading to verse 24. Now when Jesus had crossed over again by boat to the other side, a great multitude gathered to him, and he was by the sea. And behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue came, Jairus by name, and when he saw him, he fell at his feet and begged him earnestly, saying, My little daughter lies at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her, that she may be healed, and she will live. So Jesus went with him, and a great multitude followed him and thronged him. Now, as is my normal method of teaching, just to bring you up to speed and give you some background reminders so that we can take this particular portion of Scripture and this experience in context, I'd remind you that, that Jesus has just uh, demonstrated his authority over a legion of demons. He had crossed from the city of Capernaum, and when you're looking at a map of, of Israel, um, the, the city of Capernaum was on the uh, Sea of Galilee. It's uh, uh, in the north, just a bit, uh, it's on the shore in the north, just uh, a little bit to the west, and he had been there in uh, the city of uh, Caperna uh, Capernaum, and he had crossed over. He had traveled about six miles or so southeast to, uh, to a place uh, called the region of the Gadarenes. Uh, when he and his uh, other ships had landed, there was a man there who was severely possessed by uh, a demon, and that man approached him, and, and uh, this was one who was possessed by many demons. As a matter of fact, when, when, when Jesus spoke to him and said, what is your name? He said, we are a legion, which was another way of saying we are a multitude of demons. And this man who was uh, severely demonized was in great torment. And Mark told us that this one was uncontrollable. He was often bound by chains often bound by shackles, and night and day that he was in the mountains, in the tombs, he was crying out, he was cutting himself. And, and when he saw Jesus, uh, the Scripture tells us that he ran up to him, he fell down before him. Now, that wasn't because he was a true worshiper of Jesus Christ. It's because he knew who Jesus was. He wasn't worshiping him from faith, but from fear, because the Master was before him. And and though the people didn't honor Jesus, the demons knew exactly who he was. They knew him, and they feared him. In chapter 3 of Mark, verse 11, it says, The unclean spirits, whenever they saw him, fell down before him and cried out, saying, You are the Son of God. Well, after questioning the chief demon, the spokesman, uh, Jesus allowed the horde to enter a herd of swine, and and they ran down a steep place. They plunged into the Sea of Galilee, and they drowned. All the swine were drowned. And, and when those who fed the swine saw this, uh, Scripture says they fled. They spread the news of what had happened. Well, that drew a crowd of people. They were curious. They wanted to know what had occurred. And to their surprise, they came upon the man who was seated at the feet of Christ, and he was completely delivered. The one who once roamed about naked was clothed. He who once was a violent, raving, demonized man was at peace. He was in his right mind. So those who saw it gave testimony of what had happened. But instead of giving the Lord Jesus honor, they rejected him. They actually asked him to leave. They were shaken more about the lost revenue than about the man who was now free. And though they wanted Jesus to leave, the one who was delivered wanted to leave with him. So he began to beg Christ, allow me to go with you. But Jesus said, no. In verse 19, Jesus told him, go and tell your friends, which is what he did, which is interesting because later on, as we go through the gospel of Mark, we'll come to, to chapter 7. And in Mark chapter 7, it says at verse 31 that Jesus came to the Decapolis as he was on his way to the Sea of Galilee, which is the region that the demonized man was. He was in the Decapolis. And then he goes on in chapter 8, verse 1 to to speak of a very great multitude that Jesus ministered to in that region. So it would seem that this man, as he had gone out speaking of all that God had done, had actually uh, created an anticipation, an expectation, a multitude who wanted to go and hear what the Lord Jesus Christ can do. And so what we saw in that story was someone who had been saved can become immediately one who speaks of the things of the Lord, an evangelist. 
This man was brand new in his faith, but he was a living testimony of what God can do. And because of this, he was anxious. He was able to share of the great power of God. And we saw that. And last time we were together, I, I had concluded with Psalm 66, verse 16, where it reads, Come and hear all you who fear God. I will declare what he has done for my soul, which is what we do. We go out and we speak concerning the mighty works of God, how the Lord has done something in our behalf and what he has done for our soul. And that's what this one had done. And so as that has taken place, we now begin at verse 21, because at verse 20, it says he departed and began to proclaim in Decapolis all that Jesus had done for him, all marveled. Now, verse 21, when Jesus had crossed over again, by boat to the other side, a great multitude gathered to him, and he was by the sea. So Jesus has returned to Capernaum, having left this area called the Gadarenes. And, and the people begged him in the Gadarenes to leave their region, and he had. But once again, now he, he's in that area ministering on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. And he had been unwelcome in the Gadarenes, but now he's being asked to minister. So I want to begin by, by saying something, by actually asking a question. Again, he had been unwelcome in the gatherings, and he had even been asked to leave. We had seen in verse 17, they began to plead with him to depart from their region. So to bring some application before we actually begin to advance through the scriptures here, uh, the question I'd like to begin with is, how do you respond to those who truly are not interested in what you're saying about the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to assume that there are people in this room, I would pray that all of us are people who speak about our faith. I would hope that none of us is hiding it under a bushel. I hope that we're placing it on a lampstand so that all in the house can, can actually be enlightened by the things that God has done through his word and by his powerful spirit. But if you're sharing, how do you react to people who are not interested in what you're saying how do you react when people resist and reject you when you share with them? Not everybody's interested. We all know that. Not everybody responds immediately when you speak to them. Should you share with them? Preferably you do. Hopefully you do. You tell them, you know what? This is what God has done for me. God has changed my life. I pray that we have a number of people, if not all of you, who are knowledgeable enough of the things of the Lord to share with other people and a willingness in your heart to do so. And say that you do, say you're in your neighborhood, you're speaking to a neighbor, or say you're on the job site, you're speaking to somebody there, maybe in school and you're sharing with, with the class or with a, a fellow student, whatever it may be, and they don't want to hear you. How do you react to that? As we, we know, even our own family sometimes may reject not only the gospel, but they can also reject us. I mean, this upcoming Thanksgiving Thursday, it's not always the most pleasant uh, circumstances, is it? Well, maybe for you guys it is, you know, but sometimes it's not. Sometimes you may have somebody in the family who doesn't want to hear what you have to say. You may be there at the table. You say grace. They say, would you say grace? You know, and a lot of people are used to the rote kind of things. I memorize a, a prayer that you prayed over, over your meals, you know, bless us, O Lord, and these thy gifts which we are about to receive from thy bounty of the Christ, our Lord. Amen. I, I was taught that as a seven-year-old. That was a, a, a prayer of grace that we prayed. You know, I was taught that, but it was just a rote prayer. I didn't know what it meant. I, I was just really, you know, just ready to eat. My brother one time, when he first got saved, he said, can I say grace? And I said, sure. So this is his prayer. This is a true story. He goes, yay, God. That, that, I told Frank, I said, Frank, that is not a prayer. That was stupid. You shouldn't have done that. Well, see, sometimes what we do is we can go to our family and we can be there, and our family doesn't want to hear. They don't want to hear about Jesus Christ. They can reject you, and they reject the Lord even as they do so. It's interesting how it says in Matthew 10, 36, how Jesus said a man's enemies will be those of his own household. They don't always listen. Sometimes they even get angry. Sometimes they can say things to you. Sometimes they can reject you. Some of you know that feeling. Some of you know that. They just don't want to hear, and they get upset at what you've become. What we do with them is we love them. They're our family. We love them. We pray for them. And we wait for a new opportunity. Because they're our family, we may, 
we may have another chance to share with them. And so if, if I have family members who don't want to hear it or whatever, uh, especially when I was first saved, that doesn't really happen anymore. Obviously, it's been a lifetime for me of following the Lord. But there are times when they don't want to hear, don't want to hear, I just, I just remain silent. I don't say anything, just wait for an opportunity in the future. I love them, and I wait for a new opportunity. I'd, inv I'd invite you to do the same thing, should you incur uh, encounter that. But how about strangers? H how about those we work with, or those whom we occasionally speak to? What happens when they're resistant? What do we do if they get angry? What do we do if they become hostile? Because sometimes they do. They can become hostile to you. Matthew 7, verse 6 says it like this. Jesus said, do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. What do you do when people are hostile? Well, utilize wisdom. Utilize discernment when sharing the gospel with them. When people resist or mock when they ridicule, you can simply leave or become quiet. Instead of remaining and possibly suffering injury, sometimes it's wiser just to remain quiet and, and move on. But what about those who aren't interested but just want to argue with you? Do you just engage them in a lot of argument? There's, there's really no point in that. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 23 through 25, Paul said it like this. He said, again, I say, don't get involved in foolish, ignorant arguments that only start fights. The Lord's servants must not quarrel, but must be kind to everyone. They must be able to teach effectively, be patient with difficult people. They should gently teach those who, are, who oppose the truth. Perhaps God will change those people's hearts and they will believe the truth. So what you do is you just don't argue. You don't need to win every fight. And also, finally, be aware that sometimes by just staying there and arguing and engaging, you may actually be wasting your time. In Matthew 10, 14, if anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, shake the dust off your feet when you leave that home or town. There are times that you just move on, just press on instead of remaining and 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 all. You need to, to be careful uh, that you don't miss other opportunities uh, to share with others because you spend so much time with one person. You see, there are so many who are interested in hearing, so it's, it's wise to speak to those who have an interest. Sow the seed, move on, pray that God will send others to speak to them. It's like 1 Corinthians 3, 6, I planted the seed, Apollos watered, but God made it grow. You see, the people in the region had asked him to leave, and he did. But when he returned to Capernaum, there was a crowd waiting for him. And this crowd was anxious for him to return, and they waited in Luke 8, verse 40, it says, when Jesus returned, a crowd welcomed him because they were all expecting him. So we're going to see in a moment, there is one person who's especially anxious to see Jesus, and that one anxious to see him is a man called Jairus, who is a synagogue official. You see, from a please go away, we now see someone saying, please come. In verse 22, it says, behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue came, Jairus by name, and when he saw him, he fell at his feet. So this must have shocked the men because there's so much opposition to Jesus. We've already seen in chapter 3, verse 6, that the, the Pharisees were plotting to destroy him. And in chapter 3, again, in verse 22, they had said that his power came from the ruler of the demons. So there's opposition but here comes a ruler, a synagogue official, to see Jesus Christ. Now, when it speaks concerning him being a ruler, that, that speaks of an administrator. He was the one who was in charge of keeping order in the synagogue. He was the one who invited people to read. He was the one who would invite people to speak to the assembled people. So he was a ruler, and as a ruler, he was aware of the opposition that was bounding against Christ. More than likely, this was a Pharisee, and yet he came to Jesus Christ. Notice how it says in verse 22, Behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue came. Behold, that, that, that's a way of telling us this is highly unusual. So he says it's surprising. Now, first we saw a demonized man, and now we see a religious man. 
But both of them need the Lord, and both of them came to him. And Jairus is coming because he needs help, and he needs it desperately. Notice verse 22 again. It says, when he saw him, he fell at his feet. Matthew chapter 9, verse 18 says that he came and worshipped him. Now, Legion had come and worshipped out of fear, knowing that Jesus is the master. But Jairus worshipped with respect. It was an, an act of worshipful reverence towards Christ. Uh, when it speaks of them doing that, falling at his feet, very often that would involve either kissing the feet or the hem of the garment or even the ground before him. It's, it's, a, it's a falling before him in a uh, humbling way. And, and that act demonstrated the humility, a humility that God rewards. He was throwing himself upon the mercy of the Lord. Proverbs 3, verse 34 says, Surely he scorns the scornful, but gives grace to the humble. And that's what he's doing. He's humbling himself, and uh, he's there before him in a worshipful way. And as he's there, he's begging him in verse 23. He's begging him earnestly, saying, My little daughter lies at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her that she may be healed, and she'll live. My little girl, my young daughter, she's lying at the point of death. In Luke 8, 41 and 42, it says, A man named Jairus, a ruler of the synagogue, came and fell at Jesus' feet, pleading with him to come to his house because his only daughter, a girl of about 12, was dying. It's his only little girl. She's 12 years old. And he loved this baby girl with a great passion and was beside himself with anxiety. I have dads in this room, and this may not be true with every father. There are some men who have not yet learned how to love with a full heart and a complete heart. I encounter men often enough to see that sometimes we just weren't raised in the right way. And we don't understand passion. I, I was sharing something um, a while back, I, I did a, a men's conference in, an, in another state. And I was sharing with the men about loving and caring and dealing with loss. That was what I was sharing. And I shared how that, when I grew up, my father had told me he was Superman. Everybody in this church knows that story, so I won't bore you with the details other than to say that when my father died, I was greatly surprised by that. Because even though I was a man, a minister, the idea that my father would die of a heart attack never entered my mind. I had been raised believing that my dad had good health, was strong, and, and in the back of my mind, and I was sharing with the men, in the back of my mind, the idea that my father died was, was such a shock. It was difficult. And when I was there and he had died, I stepped outside and I shared with the men, I stepped outside of the hospital room after, after they I had said, it was dead, and I had spent my last moments with my father right after he had died uh, with his body and all. And uh, I walked outside, and my son David walked by. And again, I'm telling this to the men, and my son David looks at me, and he said to me, Superman died. And, and I said that because that was a, something that touched my heart. And my son, I didn't know that my father had lied to him, too. And, <laughs> told him that he was Superman, and so I didn't know that, but my dad had told the boys that he was Superman. And, but when I said Superman died, some of the men started laughing. And I, 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 I thought within myself, you don't have a compassionate heart, do you? You don't have the capacity to follow something and realize the depth of pain people can feel. And there are a lot of men like that. If you're of that sort, seek the Lord to give you his heart. Seek the Lord to give you his heart. Because some of us have been so damaged in life, we don't know how to show true emotion. And it really affects everything around us. We don't love our wife. We don't love our children. We don't love our friends. We don't know how to love. And so Jesus is ministering here to a man who does know how to love. And he comes to Christ and he says, my little girl. And we're told, my only little girl. 
is sick to the point of death. Come and help her. You know, when the Lord began to try and teach me about love and about loving your babies, it began fairly early. I had my daughter, Corinne, our firstborn. She must have been, well, she'd have been a little over two, probably, the more I think of it, a little less than three. We were living in our first home. We lived in a home in Ontario. And my baby girl had a very high temperature for a little, a little girl. She was, like I said, less than three. She had 100, 203, somewhere in that area. And every mother in this room knows that that's, that's a dangerous temperature, fever for a baby to have. And, and we didn't have insurance. We didn't know what to do. We didn't have any money, you know. And so uh, Marie called an emergency line and said, my baby's got a 100-plus temperature. She's around two and a half or so, and I don't know what to do. And so they told her, um, give her aspirin, baby aspirin, and, and put her in a cold tub. A lot of you know that, cold tub of water. Uh, you know that. You've probably done it. And so I carried my baby put her down, and, and I turned on the cold water, and I still remember doing this. I filled up the tub enough for me to be able to, to, to place her in it, and she, she just, when her little, her little feet hit that water, she began to kick, and she began to, to scream, you know, no, 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 she didn't want to go in the water, and, and, and I'm holding her, and you have to, you have to go in the water, baby. You have to, no, no, daddy, and she grabs me, and she's holding her on the neck, and, you know, she's, she's not allowing me to put her in, in this tub of water, and so what did I do? I climbed in the, the water with her. I held her, and I put her in the water, and I went in the water too. Why? Because she had to go in. And I could, I could not, I didn't want her to be crying. I didn't want her to be, to be going through all of that. But that's what dads do. That's what fathers do, is we, we, we put ourselves there for them. Because they're our babies, and we love them. And we, we, we don't know what else to do. So I climbed in the water with her, and, and, and I held her there so that that water would have its effect to bring down her temperature. I remember when she, she got her first shot. She, you know, she was less than a year. She was a few months old. And, and again, she was daddy's girl. I would carry her everywhere, and she had always put a little head on my shoulder. She was my baby. And, and I took her to the doctor, Marie, and I went to the doctors for her first um, uh, shots and all. And, and, and I still remember holding her when they took a little diaper and they got that spear and... and, and, and <laughs> and jabbed her with it. And, and I remember her to this day how she pulled back. She pulled back in my arms, and she looks at me face to face like, Judas, Judas, you. <laughs> she was so betrayed, and, 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 and she started to cry. And, and I still remember holding her, crying with her, and the nurse <laughs> laughing at me, you know, like, you know. What are you doing? Come on, you're a man. And you know, but you know what? I don't care. That's my baby. That was my baby. And her pain was mine. So I understand that. As sentimental as some of you fellas might think that is, or even some of you women who may think, what a weak man. I never saw that as weakness. I saw it as love. Because my baby needed her daddy. And daddy's loves Daddy's love for his baby girl. It's very few things like that. She was my baby. She was my baby. Jairus, come and help us. Help me, please. That's what he's saying. My little daughter lies at the point of death. Come, lay your hands on her that she may be healed. She'll live. So that's what daddy did. Daddy went to go get the one who could heal. He had a strong faith that Jesus could be of help. He was aware of some of the works that Jesus had performed. In, in, in Mark 3.10, it says that he healed many, so that as many as had afflictions pressed about him to touch him. So he knew that Jesus had the ability, and it was worth taking the risk 
What could I lose by coming to you? So he says in verse 23, come and lay your hands on her that she may be healed and that she'll live. So he believed that Jesus would move on his behalf and, and he made his request and, and, and his request rested on, on a genuine faith that Jesus would and Jesus could help him. In Hebrews 11 verse 6, it says, without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So as I look at this, there are things that I'm, 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 I'm learning from this passage. I, I'm learning that, that sorrow comes to all people on earth, regardless of their station in life. Jairus had advantages, but his advantages did not exempt him from pain. So the rich and the poor both suffer loss. And, and also I see that in our time of sorrow, in our time of pain, that we come in faith to Christ, to Jesus, ask him for help. And that's what he did. He came to Jesus, he worshiped him, he prayed to him, and he trusted in him. Again, the psalmist in Psalm 50, verse 15, says it like this. He said, call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you. You shall glorify me. And so, verse 24 Jesus went with him, and a great multitude followed him and, and thronged him. So Jesus goes with Jairus to minister to this little girl, and, and it's always going to be a blessing to see that, that Jesus takes time to minister to, to people, and he took time to minister to this brokenhearted father. Well, as he's on his way to Jairus' house, the crowd begins to close in on him, thronged him. Now, verse 25, a certain woman had a flow of blood for 12 years and had suffered many things from many physicians. She had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. When she heard that Jesus, when she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment, for she said, if, if only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. Immediately the fountain of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that power had gone out of him, turned around in the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? But his disciples said to him, you see the multitude thronging you and you say, who touched me? And so as they're moving towards Jairus' house, there's an unexpected interruption. Within this great crowd is a very, very ill woman. She's been hemorrhaging for 12 years. And commentators say that it may be due to a tumor, a diseased uterus. You see, she's been hemorrhaging, and according to Jewish religious law, that rendered her ritually unclean. In the Old Testament book of Leviticus, chapter 15, verses 25 through 27, when a woman has a discharge of blood for many days at a time other than her monthly period or has a discharge that continues beyond her period, she will be unclean as long as she has the discharge. Just as in the days of her period, any bed she lies on while her discharge continues will be unclean, as is her bed during her monthly period, and anything she sits on will be unclean as during her period. Whoever touches them will be unclean. He must wash his clothes and bathe with water, and he will be unclean until evening. So this issue of blood had exempted her from any physical contact with other people. She had no physical contact with family or friends, the community of faith, or anybody else. And what had happened is she, had been, she found herself in a, a, a type of isolation, and isolation from people is not a good thing. The first thing that God ever says in Scripture that is not good is that the man should be alone. We have been created in the image of God and intended to have a community relationship. It is not a good thing to be isolated. And this woman has not been able to touch another human being for 12 years. She hasn't been able to go to religious services and be around people for 12 years. We need the ability to have human contact. It's one of the reasons why when we were told that we are not to assemble, that's one of the reasons why I said, no, we're going to assemble because the body of Christ is intended to have a community, to have brothers and sisters fellowshipping. We need each other. And so this woman had been isolated 
And it says in verse 26 that she had suffered many things from many physicians and had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. So she had done everything she could to be healed in any, every way possible. She had not only lost her health, she had lost her wealth as she sought healing. And medicine had no known cure for her illness, and she was steadily declining. Well, in verse 20, 27, it says, When she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, If only I may touch his clothes, I shall be, I shall be made well. So she came behind and touched him. Luke 8, 44 tells us that she came from behind and touched the border of his garment. Now, every Jewish male had four tassels on the hem of his garment to remind him of the law of God. In the Old Testament book of Numbers, chapter 15, 38 through 40, the law says, speak to the children of Israel. Tell them to make tassels on the corners of the garments throughout their generations and to put a blue thread in the tassels of the corners. And you shall have the tassel that you may look upon it and remember all the commandments of the Lord and do them and that you may not follow the harlot tree to which your own heart and your own eyes are inclined, and that you may remember and do all my commandments and be holy for your God. So she went and she reached to one of his tassels, and, and as she did so in faith, immediately, verse 29, the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. Immediately she was healed. It was instant, it was total, and it was recognizable. Well, verse 30 Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that power had gone out of him, turned around in the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? Well, Jesus sensed that someone touched him, but not simply physically. Somebody reached and touched him by faith. And now he turns and he says, I demand a confession, a confession of praise. The psalmist in Psalm 107, verses 8 and 9 said it like this. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. For he satisfies the longing soul, fills the hungry soul with goodness. When blessings come from heaven, we are to take the time to thank the one who gives them. Well, as this takes place, he says, who touched my clothes? Verse 31, his disciples said to him, you see the multitude throng in you, and you say, who touched me? I think Jesus should have touched them with a right hand on the top of the head. <laughs> Look at it, it says throng in verse 31. That word throng in speaks of being jammed, compressed, crowded. There are people who are jostling. They're, they're, they're bumping into them. That's the whole point. It's not just that Jesus is walking and there is a crowd, but these people are pressing him and they're, they're crowding against him. Luke 8, 45, it says, who touched me? Jesus asked him when they all denied it. Peter said, master, the people are crowding and pressing against you. There's a whole crowd here. How can you ask that kind of question? How can you say that? And how could we know? You see, the disciples have yet to understand just who this man is, even though he had recently stilled a storm and they had asked, what? Well, what kind of man is this? They still don't understand who he is. We've already seen that Jesus perceives things that others don't. Remember in chapter 2 when he forgave the paralytic uh, uh, of his sins and people began to reason in their hearts? And in Mark 2 verse 8 tells us that Jesus perceived in his spirit that they, they thought he blasphemed. So his ways were not yet their ways. And they didn't understand what was going on. It may be that they were just anxious to get to that little girl in time, but Jesus was in no hurry. He knew what he was about to do. The delay was something that was part of his plan. You see, the delay reminds me of when he raised Lazarus from the dead, his friend. He was told that Lazarus was dying, but after being told, he stayed two days in the place where he was. And by the time he had arrived in the city of Bethany where Lazarus was, well, Lazarus had been dead for four days. And Lazarus' sisters were devastated, but Jesus knew all along what he was going to do because in John 11, verse 11, he had said, our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him up. You see, often God is busy working, but we're not aware of his timetable. And Jesus knows what he's going to do. 
But I wonder what Jairus is feeling. Because every moment that Jesus delays has got to feel like eternity. And so it says in verse 32, he looked around to see her who had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came, fell down before him and told him the whole truth. So he's looking at the crowd. She knows she's been detected. She comes forward. She had been isolated in her illness for 12 years. She wasn't supposed to be in that crowd. She also had known rejection. No one had been allowed to touch her. And by that time, many more than likely had forgotten her. But this is a different kind of fear. This is a holy fear. She knew exactly what had happened. She's, she's in awe of the one who healed her. So he asked, who touched me? And this made her come, out, come forward and to tell him it was, it was she who did. In Luke 8, 47, the woman, seeing that she could not go unnoticed, came trembling and fell at his feet. In the presence of all the people, she told why she had touched him and how she had been instantly healed. So she gives what we call an open confession, a testimony of what God had done for her. She had been instantly healed and openly confessed what had happened. Now notice verse 34. He said to her daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Be healed of your affliction. Notice how he speaks. He speaks lovingly. He praises her for her faith that she's just exercised. She's become like that demonized man, a trophy of the grace of God. Well, as this is taking place, verse 35, while he was still speaking, some came from the ruler of the synagogue's house who said, your daughter's dead. Why trouble the teacher anymore? As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said to the ruler of the synagogue, do not be afraid, only believe. He permitted no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. Then he came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and saw a tumult and those who wept and wailed loudly. When he came in, he said to them, why make this commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. They ridiculed him. But when he had put them all outside, he took the father and the mother of the child and those who were with him and entered into where the child was lying. And he took the child by the hand. He said, Talita Kumi, which is translated, little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl arose and walked, for she was 12 years of age. They were overcome with great amazement, but he commanded them strictly that no one should know it and said that something should be given her to eat. And so they have just said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? This one whom you've gone to bring back didn't arrive in time. Jesus didn't show up in time. You might as well just give up. But Jesus heard the word. And Jesus is telling him, Jairus, you need to have, you need to have peace. Look, peace. You, you have control of how you're going to react to this news, Jairus. Now, this may be easier for you to do after seeing what I have just done. So hold on and trust what the Lord is going to do. It says in verse 37, he permitted no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. Now the crowd has heard the little girl is dead, and these are his inner circle. He brings them to encourage their faith in him, and, and he comes to the house, of the ruler of the synagogue. There's a tumult going on there. There's, there's Jewish ritual mourning that is being observed. See, Jewish ritual mourning had three expressions. There was the tearing of the garments, they would hire professional mourners, and they would hire musicians who played music out of tune to reflect emotional grief and confusion. So there's a lot of wailing and a lot of noise. And, and he, he makes that statement in verse 39. Why make this commotion and weep? The child's not dead, but sleeping. And what did they do? They ridiculed him. So he put him outside, and he took the father, and he took the mother of the child, and they entered into where that child was lying, 
And this is how it goes at this point here. You see, Luke 8.53 says that they laughed him to scorn, knowing that she was dead. So they laughed in his face. They derided him. They wanted to humiliate him. What did he do? He kicked them out of the room. And lovingly, he takes Jairus and his wife along with his men, and he came to where the child was. That reveals to us the deep and loving compassion that he has towards his heartbroken couple. And this is what I want to close with and develop with you for a moment. In verse 41. When you read these words, Talitha, Talitha Kumi, I don't know how you hear the tone of the voice of Christ. I don't know what you may think. Maybe you think he's raising his voice, you know. Maybe you think he's speaking with a voice of command. You might find this interesting. The word Talitha is Aramaic. Talitha Kumi is Aramaic. The New Testament is written in what is called Koine Greek. Hebrew is also used, but Aramaic is, is a Semitic language similar to Hebrew. So here he's using Aramaic, which the Jews would be familiar with, of course. But the word Talitha Kumi, and this is how it's, it appears, as he comes into the room, there's a 12-year-old little girl's body laying. She's dead. She's dead. She's not in a coma. She's dead. He walks in with his men, and they're standing. And he walks in with the mama and the dad. That, that, that daddy has just been told, why bother the master anymore? Your little girl's dead. Everything inside of him is closing in. The emotion, the pain, everything is closing in. Jesus says, it's going to be okay. And Jesus walks up to the body of this little girl. And he doesn't raise his voice. What he literally says as he's speaking to her, he says, little lamb, Talita, is a way of saying, little lamb, wake up. That's what he did. It's like when my babies would be asleep and it was time to get them up. I didn't walk in with a big Symbols, wake up, get out of bed, you brats, time to go to work. I, I didn't do that. I would walk into the room. I might touch him by the shoulder. And I would say, baby girl, time to get up. Baby, baby, time to get up, time to wake up. That's what Jesus did. He said, baby girl, little lamb. Wake up. I get touched by that. I get touched by that. I call my children my lambs. That's what I call them. I call my grandbabies my lambs. I say, come over here, my lamb. I call them my lambs. Because I like lamb chops. No. <laughs> It's just my term of endearment to them. One of my babies asked me, why do you keep calling me lamb? Why do you call me lamb? I said, because you're dear to me, because I love you with all my heart, and I see you as my little lamb. Understand that. When you read this in the future, Jesus was being tender, and he was speaking to a baby girl, and he was saying, little lamb, wake up. Can you imagine mama and daddy looking at their baby? And Jesus says, little lamb, wake up. 
And she opens her eyes. And she sits up. Can you imagine what they felt when that happened? The broken heart of that daddy was healed instantly. Even though the people were laughing, scorning him because they knew she was dead, he simply kicked him out of the room. I don't need you in here. I'm going to teach something to my men to show them what kind of ministry they will have. And I'm going to show these people what kind of savior they have. And her spirit returned, Luke tells us in chapter 8, verse 55. At once she stood up. They were absolutely overcome with amazement. They were astounded. And Jairus is now experiencing this joy. He had experience with his baby for 12 years, great joy. But in contrast, the woman that had recently been healed, just healed, had experienced 12 years of sorrow. But both of them were now filled with that great joy. Psalm 126.3 says, The Lord has done great things for us. We are filled with joy for what he has done. And as this is taking place, verse 43, he commands them strictly that no one should know it and said that something should be given her to eat. He had much to do. This miracle that he has just performed is so wonderful, but perhaps she has been ill. Perhaps she hasn't eaten, so feed her. It demonstrates that she's alive, but it also reminds them that she has needs that still need to be met. And as her death and resurrection had occurred, that serves as a, as a preview of his own death and his own resurrection. He raised her from the dead, and later on, he himself, who was once dead, will come to life also. The God that we worship is the God of life. Never forget that. He can do abundantly above all we could ever ask or think. And what we as believers are to do is just trust him, hold fast to him, and realize that he's got a plan. No matter what it may be, it's always going to be good. Like he said, do not be afraid, only believe. Hold firm, because God's plan for you and God's plan for me is good. And what he did in the life of Jairus and his wife is just an emblem of something to symbolize and make us realize that he's the God of life. And we should trust him no matter what. And, and God always has a plan of some sort. We may not see what that plan is at the moment it's taking place. And we may be upset because it seems he's delaying. But in the end, we're going to be able to say, now I see how these things needed to fit together. And it all worked together for the good of those who loves him. That's how it works. Some of you may be going through something right now, wondering, what are you going to do, Lord? And God is saying, hold on. Do not fear. Just dream. Just believe. Just trust me. And watch what I'll do. Because ultimately what will happen to you is you will have the joy of the Lord. And you will be filled with his joy. Because God is faithful. Never forget that. Never forget it. Because you too are God's little lamb. Lord, we ask that you would work in us.